Lloyd Auerbach is a parapsychologist, mentalist, and paranormal investigator. This is our second conversation. We discussed psi phenomena and psychokinesis in detail. Notably, Lloyd offered lots of practical advice for people who want to try spoon bending for themselves. We also discussed some fascinating cases of apparitions, popularly referred to as ghosts. Please let us know in the comments if you managed to bend a spoon. So Lloyd, thank you so much for, for coming back and talking to me again for a second time. I really appreciate it. As we've previously discussed, we're going to split this into kind of two halves. We're going to talk about spoon bending, psychokinesis, mind matter interactions, and then we're going to get on to apparitions. Um, so I guess to start us off, maybe you can tell me, are you aware of whether we can observe a change in the structure of, of metallics, of metals, when they have been changed or, or bent via PK? Uh, we can, as long as you have a metallurgist do a little work for you. Uh, yeah. Jack Houck, who was an aerospace engineer for Lockheed Martin uh, in the late 1970s, came up with this idea of the spoon bending party, uh, the, mm. the PK party, as we call it. And uh, the the process is actually based on some sound psychological principles around psychokinesis and around human performance in general. And that was from Kenneth Batchelor, a British uh, psychologist who got involved in PK work in the 1960s. So Jack, um, after doing several of these parties, brought in a metallurgist mm. who not only introduced some brittle metals, things like hacksaw blades, where if you try to, to bend them either quickly or slowly, unless you do it really, really slowly, they snap. Mm. Um, and then also did slices of the metal uh, for some of the spoons, especially spoons and forks and other things that seem to flop over or more easily bend in the hands of the, the attendees. Mm. And they found that there was a difference between forcibly bending the spoon and which some people were doing, by the way, you know, you get into an altered state and sometimes you don't know how much pressure you're putting on the, on the utensil. So right. there, there was a difference in the structure of the metal. Um, there are grains of metal uh, in, in these utensils, which under a microscope, you don't need anything more than a regular microscope, but you do need to take a slice of the metal. There's patterns, crystalline patterns of metal. And what they found was the grain boundaries of the seemingly what Jack called, liked to call warm formed or warm forming spoons, the ones that seem to mm. flop over. Yeah. The grain boundaries were melted. And that's not the case with fractures or pressure or compression that you see on the structure when you forcibly bend those spoons, wow. whether it's shock deformation really, really fast or whether you do it slowly. So there was definitely a, a structural difference there. And yet the heat that would be required to melt those grain boundaries would have burned the hands of the people who held the spoons. Yeah. So what do you make of that then? What are, what are we supposed to do with that? You know, like that, that it's they, you, you can observe that some kind of melting process seems like it was taking place. But as you say, the kind of heat that would be required. Right, right. Yeah. So it, it seems that, you know, so what we talk about psychokinesis, about mind over matter, mind matter interaction, and whatever the process is for PK. And one of the things I, I have to step aside and say is that I've worked with other people, um, with one individual in particular who could do PK, not necessarily the metal bending but other moving other other things under control conditions and we try to to check for various changes in the environment like temperature change mm -hmm. um we look for static electricity we look for a bunch of things and each time we we tested for some different thing we picked it up the first time but not the second the second time we picked up something else the third time right. we picked up something else and the effect at the end was exactly the same every time so there's something about psychokinesis, which is why it's called the trickster effect, even within our field. I was just going to say trickster. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like our part of us doesn't want us to figure out how it works, just mm. that it works. Yeah. So my my supposition about the metal and the grain boundaries is that for in some way our consciousness is interacting with the the actual molecular structure of the metal, and you know you if you move molecules faster you get heat right mm -hmm. so but that's happening on such a localized level that it never kind of rises or bubbles up to the to the whole spoon it happens fast it's happening at, at that level of size so we never actually have to worry about getting burned mm -hmm. uh, i actually observed someone at one of the pk parties that 
Jack Hauk did for us at JFK University so many, many years ago, uh, there was a skeptic brought in by our receptionist. He was a magician friend who was visiting from the East Coast. And he was must have been really susceptible to the altered state induction because he was like, he was out. He was like it, almost in a trance. And Jack kept on handing him stuff and he kept on bending things. And Jack eventually handed him a one inch thick aluminum rod, solid aluminum rod, which he twist, twisted into a pretzel shape. Really? And afterwards, uh, in kind of the debrief, we went out for, for drinks afterwards. I, I said, well, you know, he did, still didn't believe in PK, which was really a bizarre thing. <laughs> said, How in the world did you bend that? He said, well, clearly I rubbed it fast enough. So the friction of my hand caused the inside of the, of the bar to melt and made it easier to bend. And then I asked him, do you know what the melting point of aluminum is? It's over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So I think it's, it's 1100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah. So, you know, before I even told him the, the, the temperature, I said, let me see your hands because your hands should be gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'd have to be doing some serious rubbing to create yeah. that kind of friction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and from what I understand, Jack did. A, they did a slice of that that aluminum rod as well, and yeah, they had melting inside the rod, <laughs> but wow. not on the outside, which is you know again. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fascinating. That's yeah. really really interesting. Wow. Yeah, I'm just again just thinking about those the heat and everything like that, and and how that would work. It, it kind of makes me think a little bit. I've spoken to a few people recently that have talked about healing uh, in various yeah. ways and methods, and and hot hands seems to you know come up a lot in regards to healing and people yeah, laying and, on hands. And actually, one of the easiest things to do if you have the right device is using a thermal vision camera. You can see um, how blood flow changes. Um, you know rising causing blood to rise to the surface of the hand uh, and the hands can get hot i mean we do have some degree no pun intended of changing our temperature a little bit uh at the surface not just at our core temperature yeah. um and that in itself is psychokinesis even though we would never think of it that way yeah yeah, amazing. Um, in our first conversation, we talked about your first uh, spoon bending kind of experience. I think it was at one of those parties by uh, Jack. What was his surname? Jack Hauk. H O U C K. Yeah, and there's actually a website, jackhauk.com. Okay, cool. And he has he has several papers, including metallurgical analyses, uh, and also uh, how to do a PK party. I mean, I nice. learned from him. And also his literature as well. Yeah, really. Well, I'll, I'll put the link to that in, in the description along with all of your links and everything like that. But anyway, yeah. So in, in our first conversation, we spoke about your first yeah, experience and it was at one of his parties. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder now if you could kind of talk about one of your maybe most memorable experiences of, of bending a spoon. Um, well, I, I mean, over the years. They all blend together. <laughs> yeah, they, they kind of do, they blend together. They bend together, actually. Um, <laughs> so I have, and I was looking for it earlier. I have it somewhere else here in my home office. Um, I did bend, and I know Dean Radin did this too. We both have spoons that where we actually, um, let me grab a spoon, literally pulled over the, the bowl of the spoon, which yeah. from an engineering perspective, <laughs> you can't really do. Uh, in fact, I showed that spoon to a friend of mine you know, I'm also a psychic entertainer, mentalist, and um, I know some of the best metal benders in the world. And of course, they're not using psychokinesis. They're using something else. They're doing yeah. something else. And one of the best ones um, who I was talking to, he was visiting with me and I showed him the spoon and he just looked at it and he said, oh, that has to be psychokinesis. There's just no way to do that. Uh, and, he, and he was serious because he'd seen yeah. this happen uh, even in, in some of his shows. So... That was a memorable one. I don't know. I think going back to the beginning, uh, tying hacksaw blades into knots was pretty memorable for me. I was going to ask you about the hacksaw yeah, it was as pretty well. memorable. Yeah. How, so what went down with that? What was the story there? I, it's just like Jack was handing me these things. And, you know, when he saw me bending stuff and I just literally tied it into a nice tight knot. <laughs> and, and, you know, just thinking nothing of it when I was doing it. Um, but, you know, Jack and the metallurgist are kind of both looked at me and I, I, I do remember the looks on their faces like, no, <laughs> they were just, <laughs> it was totally, as far as they're concerned, totally impossible to yeah. do. The way so it was, was the, the bottom of it, it was sharp or it, had it been blunted? Um, it, you know, it was um, a type of hacksaw blade that was, it was a long uh, black strand. It actually had small, very, very small teeth. They had mm -hmm. actually blunted the teeth a little bit. So it was a little yeah. bit easier to to hold yeah. uh, without getting cut. 
Um, but that was all they did, had done to it. And you, you just tied it into a knot. And, and again, you said like that would normally snap, I suppose, that kind of method. Because it's not yeah, that we can't physically yeah. bend that. That's going to bend pretty easily. You have easily, to bend right? it but... really, really slowly or under heat in order to actually deform that metal. You know, there's yeah. the thing is that even when I do conduct spoon bending parties, I tend to get a good mix of some heavier things, you know, just and I'll pick mm. them up at thrift stores and such. Um, I buy some basic, really basic restaurant um, type spoons or cafeteria type spoons that are not that heavy duty. And I'll also go to places like dollar stores that we have here in the United States and buy some really, really cheap spoons, which I've mm -hmm. tested out. If you bend them slowly, they snap. If you bend them fast, they snap, they break. So I include those because I see people twisting them into spirals without them breaking. Mm, and when you have something like that, that cheap, essentially, um, actually, I have to back up uh, at one of the spoon bending parties that I did. Someone bent a plastic spoon. Really? Handed them a plastic spoon. <laughs> yeah. And it stayed and bent. After... Bending that. And we all know what happens with plastic spoons unless you put them under heat. Yeah. Appropriate heat. So they bent it like significantly or like and it stayed in that position. Significantly, yeah. They didn't twist it into a spiral. I mean, you didn't get something like this. Yeah. But they did bend it over, kind of like what this fork is, something like that. Yeah, that's bizarre. This is a very heavy duty fork that uh, came from uh, one of the spoon bending parties. I actually have, you know, I, I offer people the, you know, they can take as much as they want of the, the stuff they've bent. I end up with boxes, <laughs> hundreds of bent stuff. Really? Yeah, bents, yeah. <clears throat> I can't, I can't believe anybody would leave it. I'd be, I'd be so uh, keen on taking. I think my they stuff want to take all, all of them with them, but they take the prettiest ones, I guess. <laughs> um we did we did one party a few years ago uh here that i ran that <clears throat> was very memorable for one thing that happened that had never happened at any other party uh mm -hmm. any other of these events and this was one of my students brought with him a friend of his who is a stand-up comic and one of the things about these ideas is and i think when jack called them a pk party or a spoon bending party he was right to use the word party because what happens is in terms of the psychology, the more fun people are having, the more stuff bends, the more it really is. A, it, it can be a really fun thing. So um, this stand up comic was making jokes. She was making jokes throughout the whole time. She was bending things, but everybody was laughing because she was very funny. And then we were kind of winding down. And as we're winding down, she says to me, so does anybody ever unbend? And I, I thought about it for a minute. I said, uh, we've never tried that. And so we were all, instead of, at these, in these things, part of the induction is just to everybody to yell at their spoons. This is part right. of it, right? You yell bend. So now we're all yelling unbend. And sh we only had her do it. She starts taking things like something like this, where you can see the spoon, how twisted this is. And she yeah. literally unraveled it. She unbent it and straightened it out. She did wow. that again and again and again. Again, nothing snapped. I gave her some really cheap stuff and the stuff that should have broken or snapped when it was bent absolutely should have done that when it un when she was unbending it. And I tried it myself later on with several of the others and there just was no way. So yeah. that was pretty exciting actually. And I may start incorporating that into um, some of the, the PK parties going forward. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting because normally with, I guess, with metal things like that, the more you bend it, the the more likely it is to snap. Right. Um, I guess right. with most things, actually, as you weaken it. Um, but yeah, that's that's wild. So, have you noticed any differences in terms of like, are some metals more likely to be able to be bent? Are some metals are some easier? Does it really matter? You know, would it would I have a, the same chance if I had a cheap flexible spoon that I can kind of bend like that? Or like, and on the other hand, I've got like a really rock hard thing that I'm struggling to bend with both hands. Yeah. Is so, there... Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, not everybody during these PK parties is going to consistently bend from a yeah. perspective. There's going to be, and you can actually observe, <clears throat> if you observe their hands, you can see the stress on their hands, mm -hmm. how much pressure they're putting on, you know, that they are putting pressure on. Again, there's an altered state going on here. So unless it's like a kid, who's going to do it no matter what, however they can without PK. Um, adults tend to go in and out of this altered state, slight altered state. And 
So we see sometimes if they're out of it, a really heavy utensil is going to seem impossible and they're going to they're going to try they're going to struggle but you can see their struggle and yet the mm -hmm. person next to them is taking the exact same type of utensil the same thickness the same heavy metal and bending it without any problem uh with no apparent stress whatsoever on the body on the hands so yeah. it really it, it's partly though uh, this altered state piece but it's also how much you believe you can do i mean that's the basis of all of this if you mm -hmm. think about what you're doing it's probably going to stop. In fact, you have to, this is the thing with psychic performance in any way, shape or form. You got to get out of your own way. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, when it comes to PK, it's very similar to sports psychology. The psychology of PK is the same as sports psychology. If you think about what you're doing and realize that maybe this is not really possible, it's going to keep you from doing things. Yeah overthinking it's, uh... thinking at all sometimes um, <laughs> you know, actually part of the state that you get into is a, kind of a semi-detached state a very um, non-emotional state even though you can yeah. then suddenly come back up and get excited um, and you're almost observing what's going on it's almost like your hands are doing it without your thinking about it at all or directing them uh, yeah. it's because the utensil kind of directs the where the direction you actually have to bend it Mm. do you think of the you, you mentioned it like an altered state a couple of times do you think of that as like a, almost a meditative state or it, it's sort of a meditative state um it really is about um it, it's a very light altered state i mean that's the whole idea of the induc induction it's kind of a visualization it's a relaxation state um mm -hmm. even though i call this it's called a party and people do kind of go in and out of this it is um uh, almost a medit it is a meditative state to some extent i think that it sort of is what it is yeah yeah cool i i, I know it's hard to put your finger on exactly you know the right words and things like that but yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's in that ballpark um and you obviously you can move objects as well right so it's not just about bending things yeah can, and you, can you tell me like an experience you've had with that maybe your first one or, or a particularly memorable um uh, well well my and first what were you going to say sorry before yeah, i interrupted sure. you my first personal experience was actually witnessing somebody doing it during a mini course I was taking at Mundelein College while I was in college at Northwestern. Uh, yeah. the parapsychologist, a couple of parapsychologists there, and they were doing a session on PK. And um, they had a um, big glass water jug <clears throat> and they had cut the bottom, the bottom was cut off of it. They had a very, very smooth, flat surface and they placed what has become known as a PK wheel or a psi wheel uh, in in that jug um, to cut off the airflow. And that's basically a paper pyramid balanced on a pin on a base. Right. And part of the process is, you know, you have to watch it and make sure there's not microcurrents of air kind of turning it around. So it's got to be truly still. So he was talking to us, John Bisaha was talking to us about people who have been able to move this and the mindset for it. And he said, you know, we, we can all try, you can all try this. It's, it's really, um, I'm hoping somebody can move it, but it's, you know, we don't have enough time to get you into that mindset. And this yeah. one woman spoke, spoke up and said, well, I can do it. And she sits down, faces the, um, the target inside this huge glass water jug. And all of a sudden it starts turning. Wow. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, um, <laughs> I had, I had a couple of spontaneous experiences. One actually was not too long after that. I was home for the summer. Uh, we're having kind of a family dinner party and it got a little boring for me. Uh, this is at a time when pe some people were still smoking and we had this huge crystal glass ashtray that was sitting in the middle of the dining room table. And it started moving towards me very slowly, but I, I noticed it coming closer and closer to me. And my cousin who was sitting across the table from me is looking at me uh, and looking at the at the ashtray and looking at me and looking at the because she saw it too. Uh, everybody else was yeah. busy talking, so that was again a nice, cool thing to happen to me. And then and that I, was non-intentional. That one that was spontaneous. Yeah, I think yeah, that. Yeah. And I learned later on that a lot of things happened to me um, psychically, at least initially, when I was in a really bored state. <laughs> I had out of body experiences when I was totally bored. I had all the. It's just like I, I've had all these experiences, especially PK, up to a yeah. point once i got into the field heavily into the field um the boredom factor wasn't necessary anymore but apparently it was um according to alex tanis who was a psychic i worked with when i was working at the american society for psychical research in the early 80s 
Alex kept on telling me, you're going to have experiences. He put it in my mind that I'll have experiences. It just turned out that the boredom factor um, allowed me to be in that state where I was not thinking. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's wild. What was the, were you going to share another, another, uh, like an anecdote, another experience that you had with that? Yeah. You know, um, besides how years, years later working with uh, Martin Caden, who was a science and science fiction writer and could actually move things. He was, he's the yeah. subject of a good part of my book. And I actually had an apparition experience with him, which we can talk about. Um, I was able to, Marty got me in the mindset of actually being able to move these targets in under glass he actually had a room a separate room that was walled off with a glass window and we were he was able to get me to get to move those but i i had spontaneous experiences all along the line and you know i've had things with computers one really bizarre one was early let's see it was it would have been 1987 i think it was um i was working my computer was an apple 2c computer if anybody remembers those <laughs> And uh, I had just gotten home from work. I was putting together a calendar. Uh, I had to had to get off to someone for a local organization that I was part of. Um, and I'm working on this very basic calendar program. This is actually a printing program um, from Broderbund. Uh, uh, and it I loaded into my Apple IIc, which are those big five and a quarter floppy disks. And it's working fine. Then all of a sudden, the menu starts spinning around. It's just, just without any touching any keyboard and we're, other weird things are happening. So I called Broderbun had a 24 hour hotline. I called their customer support. They were still here in the United States. Um, I told the guy what I was, what was going on. And he, and he says to me, yeah, it can't do that. <laughs> I said, well, it is doing that. He says, yeah, I can't do that. Then he said to me, how are you feeling beside being frustrated about the program? How were you feeling right before you, you loaded the program? I thought that was an odd question. So I started telling yeah. him, I was a little stressed out time-wise. He said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go uh, take a walk around the block, then come back. Here's my direct line, come back, turn up, put in the program and, and then tell me if it's working or not. So I said, okay, I have to ask you this. Why are you asking these questions? And then I said to him, uh, I'm involved in parapsychology. <laughs> We're doing research on mind over matter. There has been research on mind machine interactions, human, and then he's and he starts telling he said, Oh, and we ended up with an hour and a half conversation about <laughs> other circumstances that he and the other people that he knew uh, at Broderbund in Silicon Valley in general had noted mm -hmm. about people stressed out of how they affect their computers and programs and things like that. Wow. So that was uh by the end of the, the conversation, by the way, the program was working fine because yeah, I was not yeah. stressed out anymore. Uh, yeah. But things like that, um, I observed similar things uh, at my training job. I did training on an online system actually at the time on a, on a mon basically a, de a, a small device. It was basically a, a direct access computer. It wasn't even a computer. It was a monitor that had a keyboard and it directly connected with the system for doing mm -hmm. research. And I had a group um, of people in the in the room. Uh, this was a company which I still work for called LexisNexis, and I was training them in how to do research. <clears throat> they all entered their their past IDs and passwords. And one guy, one of the attorneys who was there, every time he hit a key at, for entering things, the monitor, the thing would crash. And like I said, these were very simple devices, so simple that if there was a problem with it, the tech usually told us to fix it. You basically lift up the front of the of the terminal and you drop it yeah. <laughs> to reset the chips. Yeah. So I, I had them there. I moved them to another terminal because we there were only six out of the twelve people, uh, twelve monitors were being used. He was there with his secretary. Um, same thing happened. Move him to a third one. Same thing happened. I moved him to one of the terminals that was already hooked up that one of the um, other folks was using. As soon as he touched the key, same thing happened. So. Um, I asked him just flat out, you know, this is at a time where people were still switching from books to computers and were barely mm -hmm. even there yet. And this is an older attorney and, and, and his secretary is laughing at this point. Um, and I said to him, so you don't like computers, do you? He said, no, I, I have this. One of the partners said, I other partners said, I have to be here. I hate computers. And then the secretary says, I won't let him within three feet of my desktop, my PC. She had an, an IBM PC. She said, I even have a tape. She had 
basically a tape on the floor outlining the border of which he could not cross because he kept on crashing her computer. Wow. And at that point, I actually brought had everybody bring up articles from our news database from Nexus about research that had been done by my colleague Bob Morris, looking at human machine interaction and how stress and all and dislike of computers causes things to crash. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a, a, a different kind of PK experience, but um, very memorable for me. Yeah, well, it's fascinating, though. It's like a real kind of untapped area. I'd love to see large scale surveys of people like if, you know, if they've had these interactions and then, you know, whether their mood, whether they noticed it, any. Cor I don't know whether it'd be easy to do with with a survey, but it'd well, be interesting I mean, to... I've done kind of like when I used to do college lectures with large audiences, I would ask before I talk mm. about this kind of thing, I would ask how many of you were so stressed out before right before a test that or a paper because i used to wait to the last minute to do papers myself so I, I do know that feeling um how many times would your computer crash or your printer not work and hands went up like all throughout the audience and of course the yeah. answer you know to why that is could be that you are possibly stressed out and hitting the wrong keys or it could be windows just you know yeah. time you know just windows um or your stress is affecting the, the computer, um, the device. Yeah. And we have, we actually have research on this. Bob Morris and others did a lot of research paid for by the government uh, in the late 1970s into the early eighties, uh, mm -hmm. human and machine interaction. And it was all spurred on by apparently a, uh, an issue with a single computer chip that should not have failed at one of our um, radar stations that showed that there were missiles coming in oh, when wow. all the other radar stations did not. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, they were worried. And it turned out the the operator was incredibly stressed out at that time. So they, they you know, they said, we got to We got to look at this. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. We've got to move you. <laughs> We've got to put you somewhere else. Yeah. Get you away from that chip. Um, yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, back to spoons for a minute. So yeah. I've, I kind of mentioned briefly before that, that I've spoken to now a few people since since you that have managed to bend spoons. So Dean Radin, uh, Ed Kelly. Helane Wabe and uh, and Sean Cahill and they all kind of describe you know slightly different way that it worked for them or how it how it happened exactly but it all had the in common that they physically kind of made the movement of bending it just kind of was like putty you know when they bent right, it right right um, but I wanted to ask you because there are some videos online and you know I don't know how accurate it is. I don't know whether the videos are real for for start at all. Um, but I wanted to ask whether you've ever managed to bend one without actually the movement of bending. So simply, for example, like holding the 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 bot of the stem or the the handle yeah. in one hand uh, and yeah. the top just bending. Because uh, yeah, if, that that I mean, every once in a while in some of the spoon bending parties that I've done, that has happened. Mm. Uh, and sometimes wow. it was me holding not the um, not the end of the spoon, but the bowl of the spoon, and this would flip over. Rare for me to do this. Um, although sometimes, like I said, with the uh, with some of them, it just meant I didn't have to actually guide it. I just had to push, mm -hmm. yeah, with one finger, which is very different. I mean, leverage wise, you can't really do that. So, um, so e even though the hands guide it, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't take more than just a finger to to actually direct where things thing need to go. Yeah, and I actually yeah, but you, again, though we have the spontaneous things that have happened to me. I, I've got a key in my key ring that bent on its own, um, causing me <laughs> real problems. Actually, and it was because I was stressed out. Really? That so that happened while it was what like in your pocket or how? Did that uh, yeah. Happen? So yeah, and I carry it on my for I carry it for another reason. You know, as I mentioned, mentioned I'm a metalist, and um, I actually have there's a way to actually use an already bent dot, uh, spoon or or key in this play, case to make it look like you're bending it like in, on the spot. So I always carry it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this, this particular key. Yeah. Wow, All right. Man. So uh, this was um, the, the front door key to my apartment back right. in the late eighties into the early nineties. And I was um, spending the day with a production company from the TV show sightings. They were doing um, one of the early specials that before the series had actually been picked up. <clears throat> and I was uh, spending the day with the director and, and on camera, also helping out as a consultant with some of my colleagues who were being interviewed. And we had um, <clears throat> done things in San Francisco. We were down in Silicon Valley, which is a good, um, uh, with no traffic, it's an hour drive for me. Uh, with traffic, it can be 
couple hours, three hours, depending on the time of day. So we had just finished interviewing someone uh, in Silicon Valley and we were scheduled to go back to my apartment that evening or the next day and preferably the next day to do a, a final interview with me. So we got done early and um, the director, Rob Kirk, said, hey, let's go. Let's move your interview up to like this afternoon or later this afternoon. And I, my thinking was, yeah, I was going to get home and clean up my apartment first. <laughs> so now I'm really stressed because I have to go ahead of them. I fortunately was going to have an hour, no more than an hour lead time on them. So I drove really fast to my home. I get start, I park my car, have my keys in my hand. Um, I walk up to my apartment door and in my hand, I have my keys in my hand, kind of like this. I'm feeling movement in my hand. And I look down, I put the keys in my other hand, look down and the key is bending. And this is the front door yeah. key to my apartment. Oh, it's bending at the it's way bending. I see it. it bending. I actually see what? it bending. <laughs> so fortunately, my roommate was home because <laughs> otherwise yeah. I would have had to have the manager let me in. Um, but that was, you know, I've had things yeah. like that happen over the years. I even have had, and I don't know, I'm assuming I did it, um, but I've had on two occasions, I've had a TV set. I had a portable black and white TV set early in the 80s. Um, again, stressed out, come home, uh, come to a different, completely different apartment, it's an earlier apartment, and the TV turns itself, is turned on. I had moved the, the TV from the living room into my bedroom. The TV turns on, and I, I was a little confused because the plug is hanging down in the front of the dresser where the TV's sitting. It's not plugged into anything. And my roommate came in, um, cause I call for him and we're standing there watching the TV and it's, it's on for five minutes and then it turns off and it wasn't plugged in at all. Wow. And I had something similar happen when I was visiting, um, my family, my parents, uh, back in the early two thousands, um, my brother, one of my youngest brother had left some stereo equipment in his old room, which is where I was sleeping since my dad had turned my old room into an editing suite for television. And, uh, the stereo went on and it wasn't plugged in. <laughs> And it's playing for quite a while. So whether it was me or maybe some ghost that was kind of hanging around, I don't really know. I certainly <laughs> anything else. Yeah, either way, they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> no, but we've had, you know, that's the thing is that I've talked to many people. I had a case where appliances were going on and off and they weren't plugged in. I mean, this is something we've seen uh, reported around and even witnessed uh, over, over time. And yeah. I mean, think about that. If we could forget about anything else with psychokinesis, maybe other than healing, if you could actually harness that, you know, we have a sustainable uh, power yeah. service source at that point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That The, the, the possibilities are uh, unlimited with that, I suppose. Um, so now, Lloyd, it'd be great if you could uh, give that kind of beginner's guide to, to, to spoon bending or more, more ap appropriately, I should say, a beginner's guide to having a PK party because you told me that that's the, the most effective uh, way to, to do this. Um, so yeah, please take it away and, and take, a, take as much time as you want. Okay. Well, first, it's important to have people around you. Um, mm -hmm. I have been able to, although it's been a little bit of a struggle, do uh, a PK party with five or six people. <clears throat> but usually what you want is at least 10 or 12. And, you know, depending- You think on five or six is a rough minimum? You'd I say. would say five or six is really a rough minimum. And they have to be people who are, you know, you don't want people who are- we're going to look at this and say, oh, this is crap or, you know, this is ridiculous. You want mm -hmm. people who want to who want to try to do this, really want to try to do this. Kids are OK. Um, just know that there's a tendency often for certain kids at certain ages to to do it, to bend things however they could, regardless of whether or not they're um, in, involved in the induction or involved in the process. Otherwise, yeah. uh, so um, I'd say, you know, 10 to 12 is a good number I've done. I've done as many as 30, and that's only because of the venue. The venue only allowed me to have that many people. Jack, right. uh, I attended a workshop by Jack Houck where I think there were about 100 or so people, but he had helpers because you also want someone to observe people and encourage them as they're doing things too. So mm -hmm. you don't want that many people. Um, you just know that if you are um, doing this, even though you're conducting the induction, you're doing all this, you will still bend stuff. So I'm still bending things in these circumstances. Yeah. So that's an important thing. Um, you want to clear out a space because we want people to move around. This is not a sit down kind of situation. 
This is a moving, an action type of thing. PK is action. You want a little bit of action. You want to be able to move around. You also want to prepare yourself and prepare the situation with, a, with at least 10, maybe even 15 utensils, mostly spoons. Forks are good too. Um, have those there uh, yeah. for each person, that many for each person. Okay, about 15 per person. Yeah, yeah, 10 to 15 per person. I usually have a minimum of 10 per person because if you have certain people start really bending, I mean, I had one person at a PK party bend like 30 things, just kept on bending and bending and bending. <laughs> and uh, um, that meant there were less spoons for everybody else. So yeah. you, you really want to have enough. And if they, you have leftovers, so you keep them for another time. That's all. Or you stick them in your utensils drawer and you just use them at home, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they should be, uh, the the metals themselves, I, I meant, should be just simple spoons. I typically go to a restaurant supply place or one of the big box stores and buy a set of spoons and maybe a set of forks, maybe a couple of sets of spoons. They're not usually heavy duty. Um, they, they can be bent pretty easily, but not really easily, but easily enough if you just try and it's always a good idea to take a spoon and try to bend it like see if you can do that and how much pressure it takes you know give yourself yeah. a little bit of an opportunity to see what it's really like if you were to physically bend things too mm -hmm. uh go to thrift stores buy heavier duty pieces because you can get cheap old silverware um that doesn't have to be silver you know just metalware um if you find some silver you know silver plated things or copper plated things that's fine too it doesn't really matter i know that in some of the situations uh we've had some really big heavy duty ladles and things like that just to bend the um cool bend the handles and things i i'd keep it to the spoons and forks type thing at that point yeah <clears throat> all right now uh you've got all that together you get everybody in the room and I do a, a few other things sometimes before the, the PK party, before the actual spoon bang, but you can just launch right into it. Um, I usually tell people about psychokinesis and about the performance of it and all that. So, because, you know, I'm a parapsychologist, I want to educate them also. Mm -hmm. But if you want to yeah. do a party, just launch right into it. So for just to jump in on that one, just a second. Yeah. Um, music, would you have music? Do you advise against it? And the I, same I question, say, alcohol. Yeah, you want happy, fun music. Okay. okay. So find out what people are not going to like and don't play that. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, it should be fun. Um, it shouldn't be subdued. So, you know, no soft yeah. jazz. That's not going to work. Um, I tend to play because it's one of my favorite groups, a lot of Earth, Wind and Fire, because it's very yeah, nice. up upbeat stuff as it happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you, you know, there's some great old classic rock you can do. There's a lot of things. Maybe, you know, if the groups into country do that, I stay away from that completely. Um, so okay. the personal preference, some nice uplifting, uplifting music. And yeah, what about, um, alcohol? Is it better to stay sober or is there no problem with having a few drinks? What's your take on that? Um, most of the things that we've done, I know that Jack did and I've done have been in circumstances or settings where we could not have alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, however, <laughs> I have done a couple for friends uh, over the years and we were drinking a little bit um i don't know that anybody was truly inebriated at all because it was sort of yeah. the beginning of the situation uh i i don't see you know you don't want somebody getting certainly too much alcohol but mm -hmm. it's okay if there's people are drinking a little okay I think. it's not gonna like stop it stop us being able to do it at all no. or anything like that no i mean yeah. alcohol can remove your inhibition so it might even help a little bit for certain people that's true uh, yeah. but if yeah, it goes too true. far then you have them acting in a different way <laughs> you really don't yeah yeah, I got you. Depending on the kind of drug um, they actually are. Yeah. 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 So anyway, before I interrupted you, I think you were going to talk about how, yeah, the, the PK kind of part of that, like you, you kind of give a bit of an intro to the PK. Yeah. And, 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 about it and giving an intro to PK and talking about it, it's not necessary. But one of the things you could talk about, and I, I usually suggest people do this, is something, again, It's it, this is very much like sports psychology. If you doubt yourself, if something is starting to move or to bend and you suddenly think, oh, I can't really do that or you're surprised by it, you may find that you can't bend it anymore. This is a case of, um, we have two principles that Kenneth Batchelor came up with back in the 60s for psychokinesis that are most mm -hmm. important. One of them that we are programmed for in Western society and many other societies is something called witness inhibition. That mm -hmm. when we see something really weird, 
we write it off. We come up with an explanation. We ignore it completely. And things that are bending is pretty weird. So seeing other people do it, many other people do it, does help you do it as well. So that kind of helps you in the setting, will help you pass your witness inhibition. Because the purpose is to see something weird in this circumstance. Mm. The other is ownership resistance. And that's what the induction that I'll be doing here um, is and what Jack taught me and what and what I've added to and other people have added to, this is where we're trying to get you past the idea of resisting owning up to PK. So in other words, if you resist because it feels really weird, my thoughts getting turned into action, that is scary. And it is scary. I mean, for many people, uh, PK is scary for people. So mm-hmm. we resist owning up to it, that I did it. If something moved, like that ashtray I described earlier in the show, um, I knew I somehow knew it was me, but I could just as easily have said, oh, no, no, I can't possibly have done that. That must be a ghost, Yeah, which is how we end up with people thinking that PK often is caused by spirits. Mm -hmm. So we want to get past that. And that's what the whole purpose of this is. All right. We want to have fun. So you're going to act silly. The sillier you are, the better it is. Right. So if you're going to have kids there, you could even have them just watch because they can watch a bunch of adults get really silly and they'll have a lot yeah. of fun. Especially preschoolers yeah. will love this. They'll really get excited by this. Uh, yeah. Teenagers, maybe not so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But everybody really needs to participate. If, if you're not going to be like participating, then stand to the side and just watch. That, that right. just is the best way to do it. And yeah. then I will, I'll launch into an induction. And this is pretty simple. So everyone is standing up. I've asked everyone to grab typically two spoons or a fork and a spoon or a couple of forks and to hold them in their hands in front of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, they, these may not, may or may not be the spoons. They're going to, the things they are going to bend first. Also know that you're going to drop stuff on the floor. So wherever you're doing this, uh, just know there should be piles of whether it's on a table or on the floor, piles of unbent stuff, and people should be able to just drop their other stuff anywhere else. Plus, as we go through this process, if you pick up a spoon and it doesn't feel like it's going to bend, grab another one. Find one that you feel is that it feels that it's going to bend for you. So that's an right. important factor too. So that both of those things just keep continue to keep in mind as we go through. So you want to if you see people just dumping stuff on the floor and it's unbent, pick it up if it feels good to you. Just bend it. Okay. Like a wand in Harry Potter, the wand chooses the wizard, right? That's so here correct. The spoon yeah, the, chooses the, uh... the spoon. I don't know if the spoon actually chooses you, <laughs> but uh, part of you does choose, just does connect with that, yeah. the right spoons. That's right. Yeah. The right pieces. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> so now uh, everybody is standing around. We stand around in a circle typically. Um, everybody's holding a spoon and fork, myself included, as I'm doing the induction. And what we're going to do is close your eyes and I want you to just imagine or visualize and hopefully everybody here can visualize if not, because there are people who cannot do that just as best you can imagine that there is energy all around us because there is, Mm -hmm. you know, at the very least we have all sorts of signals going through us from 5g and and below broadcast signals. There's energy off the earth. The earth has magnetic fields. There's energy all around us. There's energy above us. And what you're going to do is you're going to grab some of that energy and bring it into your body and into the spoons. So imagine now for a moment that above your head is a swirling whirlpool of energy, of light. Mm -hmm. Any color you like, it is the force. If you're a Star Wars fan, we're tapping into the force right now. Nice. And just as an aside, I often use a lot of Star Wars analogies because everybody's familiar with Jedi and the Force and all that stuff. So that makes it yeah. easier for me. Yeah. All right. So what you're going to do now, you're going to imagine that that swirling energy above your head. Now I want you to mentally make the energy kind of come down at a point. Mm-hmm. Pull it down into the top of your head. Pull it down into your head. Pull it down through your body. Start pulling it down past your head, past your neck, have it spread out into your shoulders, into your arms, into your hands, into the spoons, into the utensils, but have it also continue down your body, 
it's going to move down it's going to split again and it's going to hit your feet and it's going to hit your feet hard you're going to feel the earth and then it's going to bounce back up stronger than ever and it's going to add to what you've already split off into your shoulders your arms and your hands into the spoons and reinforce that and on the count of three you're going to open your eyes you're going to look at your hands and you're going to yell bend three times so at that point i have people i count down to three everybody starts yelling bend I bring them back again. I say, now bring the energy in again. We're going to yell bend again, do that. And then I typically say, feel which of the utensils, which hand is going to feel is more connected to you, is going to bend, drop the other one on the floor. And then they right. will take the utensil. I said, now watch what I'm doing and see how it, if it curves, if it feels like it's going to go in a particular direction, just very lightly test it to see which direction it will go. If it feels like it can go in one direction, start pushing it down in that direction, pushing it up in that direction. And just follow the way the, the utensil, the spoon wants you to take your hands. Now, some people will start bending immediately. I actually um, occasionally do um, bend first, like one of the first people, I kind of because I'm in that mindset myself. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this very clearly. Um, one of the things that Bachelor also discovered is that, uh, and this is, uh, this is something that's been identified by folks looking at, um, shaman and witch doctors and pra magic practitioners, magic, in, in other words, the real thing, basically it's psychic stuff in different cultures around the world is that to get people in the right mindset, sometimes you fake things. Right. And so occasionally, uh, if I'm not feeling like I'm, it's actually gonna bend on its own, I will bend it <laughs> with pressure. And yeah. I will make a big deal about that and say that it's PK because I want people to have their eyes wide and up, open and I want them to get past that witness inhibition of having seen it. Yeah, and be like, oh, it's possible, he's it, doing it, I, right. I can and do so it. So then people yeah. will start doing it. And again, I can observe and see that some people have done it by, by pressure and I might pull those aside at that point, those spoons aside, but the next one they bend just bends really easily. So it's, it's a, it is a process to get into this. As we're doing this, as people are, are and are not bending, we'll stop every once in a while and do the yelling again. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, having people mill around. We've got the music going. I want, we see people, depending on how the people are getting either serious or laughing. We like to see a lot of laughter. That's always a good thing but sometimes people just get focused. So you do have to kind of keep the energy going by having them yeah. yell at the spoons again. It, it's, it is very, very goofy. And what really happens the first few times that this happens with yelling, everybody yelling, you get certain people giggling, which is good. I want that to happen. I want them to giggle because it feels silly. And the yeah. sillier it is, the better, like I said. Wow. And so when everybody's yeah in the room and, and they're trying to bend and they're, they're laughing, is everybody talking? Are you just talking oh, they, about they anything? Absolutely, yeah. You know, I, I bent something. They're yelling, yeah. you know, they're bending or it's the people are surprised. Oh, it's bending. It's bending, you know, and that kind of yeah. thing. So you really want that interaction <clears throat> as much as possible. Sometimes in the, depending on how things are, it feels like the energy is getting down because people are getting too focused. I'll have them do the visualization again. I'll stop. We'll do that again just to reinforce it. Yeah. And um, usually I'd say that um, on occasion, I have one or two people out of the 30, if I'm doing 30 people that haven't bent anything. Mm, only one or two. Uh, um, I, I, I it, It's pretty rare, but, you know, there might be one person in every group. Um, and that person may be more interested in watching what's happening. That's what I often find that they're more watching. But I did have one one set with a couple of people who had had a lot of psychic experiences, but not psychokinesis experiences. And they were very upset that they hadn't bent anything. Yeah, and I talked I to them that. quite a bit about it. And I found that they didn't believe it. Mm. They, they kept on saying, you know, the other people, I'm pretty sure they're putting pressure on it. In other words, they were not buying into the idea that this could really be possible. <clears throat> and that is why they didn't bend anything. What would you advise to somebody that, 
I guess, has that in the back of their mind. Um, like I use myself as an example, I guess. It's just, I'll just do it. Like I've spoken, like I said, to all these people that have done this now. I've spoken to you and and, and I have no, with everything else that I've learned is possible and, and that is backed up by the statistics. I, I believe that there's every reason that this, you know, is possible. Absolutely, why not? Um, but there's probably, you know, there's still that nagging doubt in the back of your mind, right? Where it's it's totally normal because it's something that goes against everything we were taught, everything we grew up with, everything that was, you know, the our perceived version of reality. And so how do you yeah, shut down that little, because again, even if it's not really loud, even if I'm not going to be in my head, I'm not going to be saying, oh, I can't do this. In fact, I'll be doing the opposite. I'll be like, you can do this, you can do this. But to actually truly believe it is like another level. So what advice would you give for that to try and... Well, you know, yeah. first of all, I think it's really important that people know that they can always do that after the, after the party they can you know i've had people come back and say oh i'm positive i bent this with pressure it's like okay good for you um because they were rationalizing what was it but they were doing a lot of bending like that magician i mentioned earlier in the in the thing who had a, a, a wacko explanation for how he bent a, a one inch thick aluminum rod yeah um, an explanation that makes no sense whatsoever so <laughs> it it that's part of it and you can even say that to folks if you have any doubts You'll be able to express those doubts and think about it later. Just have fun. And I, I think that it's really about the approach the person takes. If they're trying to have an experience, great. Uh, but the whole idea of calling this a party is that this should be fun. And this is part of the, the discussion you have with everybody up front. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I will tell you that um, in some of my workshops, my PK workshops, before I do the, um, the spoon bending part of it, um, I often will do something with a pen, have everybody with a pendulum. Right. You know, and talk about the idiomotor response and that, you know, when you hold a pendulum and, and you think circle, it's for most people, it's going to start moving in a circle. Even though you're, mm. you're positive, you're not moving your fingers at all. There are minor muscle impulses that are doing that for you. This is not PK the way we think of it, but it is PK because your mind, your unconscious is moving something that you have no conscious control over at that point mm -hmm. and yeah. by doing that uh even the people who are doubting you know and because you're giving them a rational explanation for how that's working right um i often also when i say i talk about pk before the spoon bending i talk about the jack house parties i talk about the metallurgist and the slices of metal and the melted grain boundaries so we know something unusual is happening here so if you, mm -hmm. if you put it in the context of something unusual people sometimes will rationalize well there's something other than pk but maybe i can do it anyway so that yeah. kind of helps them get out of that, out of their own way. Um, I have had people when I've done um, in the workshops, sometimes I do those wheels, um, the paper target on top of something. And I've had people, it, it's really actually kind of funny. Um, you have folks who they try to do it. They can't do it, um, even with the discussion how, until they see someone do it. Mm. And when one person does it, there's a kind of a domino effect. And yeah. then every once in a while, I would have one student who's got this thing spinning and they'll, there was one student in particular, I'm just thinking of who just looked at it and she looked down and it's spinning and her eye, she looks at me and her eyes are like this. And it stopped as soon as she did that. It just oh, really? stopped dead and wow. she couldn't do it again because mm. yeah. it freaked, it basically freaked her out is what happened. Yeah. Yeah, and you kind of snap out of it, yeah. I guess, whatever, like, altered state, like you said earlier, right. that you're in. But, but I know, suppose then... I was going to say, sorry, for, go on. fortunately, with the spoon bending, um, you can rationalize because you have your hands on it. Yeah. It's harder to rationalize if the things move on their own. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. That's true. Um, so I guess, yeah, for, for somebody, again, like me, like, with if you have those doubts just in, in the back of your mind, you know, in terms of for the PK party, you basically just bury them don't give them any attention and just focus all on the other side that right, the fact exactly. that you believe it to be possible you know and everything like that and and so so you, you're not going to get rid of them i guess would be largely you know it's impossible to believe something without believing something and you see what i'm saying but so you just ignore them bury them and just pay them no attention yeah and, and if you come them. in with the idea that everybody's bending it because they're pre putting pressure on it that's fine you know um You'll still probably bend it if you are if you're by, you know getting that slight altered state. You're still going to probably yeah. bend if you're having fun. You're going to bend, and later on you can say hey, it's all pressure. You know it's nothing psychic actually happened. 
is it okay for people to kind of choose their own like you know technique like how they hold it and how they oh, bend yeah. it because personally for me i would want to bend it in a way i'd want to find a way with each spoon that it that i would really have to put a lot of force to bend it you know just purely with my physical yeah i mean strength. just just know that you know um somehow the utensil directs how the how it's going to actually go mm -hmm. yeah. whether it is um, i guess you said earlier you see which way it wants yeah to... i mean here let me pick up these two all right so this fork which is very very heavy um not only did the the fork bend this way but the tines this is one i actually bent the tines actually direct me to bend them a little bit not very yeah much. all right so I tried bending it any other way. I tried bending the tines a little bit more. I could not do it. So once it actually finished bending, I could not bend it anymore. I couldn't unbend it without significant mm. pressure on it. So yeah. it kind of directs that. The other is this one, something like this, where you have this really tight, this is a tight spiral, not as tight as the other one I had. Um, so this is something I see quite a bit is that you can just kind of wrap them around, twist them when you're wrapping them around pretty easily. But I, one of the things I would, truly suggest people do because i've tried it since the one time that i bent the bowl of a spoon over is see if you could just simply pull over the bowl of the spoon if it feels like that'll work do that or collapse the bowl of the spoon or, yeah. or flatten the bowl of the spoon because those things yeah. you know when you go back to that after the fact there's a, a real issue in terms of how you could have done that with your string yeah. uh, and your fingers yeah definitely leaves a lot less yeah. room for doubt if you do something with the bowl absolutely um and in terms of the headspace that people should try and be into like earlier we we kind of mentioned alter altered state of consciousness we kind of mentioned a meditative-esque state um is it just is it about being you know having not too much going on up there and and then yeah. just just being focused on the matter at hand that and and trying to get excited and and fun funky fun like that's, you say, that's exactly and... it yeah um you know my experience of spontaneous pk and other forms of pk is that there's no there's no thinking going on um uh, not the kind of like you know i'm i'm look at this i'm there's no mental narration happening let's put it that way yeah i'm yeah not narrating what how the spoon is bending um my mind is just simply visually seeing the spoon bend. That then that's what yeah. it's actually, and I'm feeling what I'm feeling in my hands. But and it's, you, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I was just going to say. I suppose you try to avoid letting your mind wander as well to like, oh, what am I going to have for dinner later, or what am I going to do tomorrow, and think you well, kind of stay in the moment. Or? Distraction is actually not a bad bad idea. Um, okay. One of my colleagues, Pamela Ray Heath, did her doctoral dissertation on the experience of PK, and one of the constituents that she came up with is sometimes that. The moment of distraction or taking away from what's going on can actually mm -hmm. help the process. Now, the whole idea of the PK party is doing that. It's just you're distracted by the action, by everybody moving around. So there is that distraction. But if you're trying to move an object like one of those little paper targets, the side wheels, um, you know, there's this idea that comes from pop culture that we concentrate. You know, I say concentrate on making that move. And we see in, in movies and things, people's face getting red and they're stressing out and there's a vein throbbing on their head as they're trying to make something move. This is what the imagery is that we've all grown up with all, you know, in certainly in films and television programs over the years. It's actually not that. Uh, yeah. What happens if you watch people doing PK, mentally they're focusing on an end result. I want this thing to move in a certain direction. I want this, this to actually happen. That's the whole idea of bending. It's gonna bend. Um, I might have a mental image of that happening, but it's actually when you stop concentrating and just trust that this is moving. In other words, I, I'm, I want it to move. I want it to move. I want it to move. And then I stop and go, okay. And you back off. And now that's the moment when things actually start happening mm -hmm. that end goal. Yeah. So it really is. Uh, and the faces of people doing this are as devoid of emotion until they see this actually happening. Um, it, it's like they're coming on kind of blank slates at that point. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I like to call it the um, Mr. Spock or Vulcan state of mind. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, like you say, once it happens, once it's going to, it's probably going to be a dominoes effect because everybody's all of a sudden going to start to believe that it's possible and, yeah. and then it's going to become possible. Um, I wonder as well, have you kind of come across people 
jumping and bending it while they're jumping. Sean Cahill, one of the people I mentioned I spoke to that, that bent a spoon, he tried that. I think he was in the Monroe Institute at the time. And funnily enough, they did something with a pendulum because you mentioned that as well. Mm-hmm. They did something with that beforehand. I think they were asking like uh, if the spoon is going to bend or something. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's a good um, thing because your unconscious will tell you that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah um and so anyway he he told me that yeah when he managed to do it he kind of jumped in the air and and i i think he shouted i can't remember exactly the details um and kind of in that that outburst of like emotion of the jump and the shout and and stuff then it he came down hit the ground and it was I, bent I, I i've never seen anybody j- jumping or hopping uh doing the bending process yeah <laughs> moving yeah. around uh yeah but you know i guess i could check try that next time <laughs> yeah no harm in trying it maybe uh, yeah maybe it's like a I'll secret play, little trick I can, I can play this pointer sister song jump and see what happens <laughs> yeah absolutely why not like you say it's all about being like silly and getting in the mood so maybe some for some people or in some certain circumstances that's a good way to help yourself let go maybe of of certain things yeah I, um, i've tried to figure out is there like a, a, a movie or a tv show um a really funny thing that i could show people to get them really laughing first yeah um and i've actually found a british show that i think is hysterically funny but i know that it's a little slapstick so i don't know that everybody would think the same thing which show um the goes wrong show okay I haven't there was seen actually that. A, there to... was actually a play on they did a play a play version called the play that goes wrong there's um, it's on a number goes wrong shows on at least the first seasons on a number of the free streaming services. It's a yeah. theater group that does a different pl- type of play every week and things go horribly wrong in the play right. there. It's hysterically funny. There's a lot of physical comedy. Um, it's very, very funny. Sometimes it's just the set is built wrong. Yeah. Things like that. Uh, there's yeah. a, a version of it called Peter, the Peter, Pan, uh, Peter Pan goes wrong, uh, which is on YouTube. You can find that version of uh, they did the Peter Pan play and it, it just, but I know like my wife doesn't think it's funny. <laughs> it's too plastic <laughs> for her. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. Um, and so I guess along those lines as well, maybe it'd be a good idea to play some, you know, unrelated games, just normal sure, games or sure. something like that, just to kind of get people e- eased into it, relaxed and get a bit of an atmosphere going. Right. Um, uh, but just and... keep in mind that some people are always competitive yeah <laughs> and get too serious when they're playing whatever game it is so be careful yeah too because that'll suit a suitably through. silly game that nobody can <laughs> that almost nobody can be competitive about um and i guess one of the last things i wanted to kind of check with you or quiz quiz you on about this is um is there like a recommended time frame would you say like oh if nobody's bent within two hours just give up oh, go God, and try yeah, again I, another yeah, day I, or... I, I wouldn't go for more than a half an hour after the induction Okay, so half an hour to get your first bend, and if nobody's bending after yeah. that, like you, you can start to. And honestly, if nobody's yeah. bent after the induction for the first ten minutes, we do another induction. Right. Okay. Uh, just repeat- basically the same. Yeah. Say repeating basically the same that. Stuff. Yeah, because I I don't want. First of all, it it gets really boring. Uh, it's very disappointing, and it kind of brings the room down, and it makes it really hard to even continue afterwards. Mm. So it might yeah, even be, you I know, see. I I know in in one instance, I five minutes later. Nobody bent anything. Five minutes later, I did another induction and then people started bending. So I didn't yeah. wait very long for that. But I would definitely yeah. not keep people there for two hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Even with multiple inductions, if nothing's bending, nothing's bending that day. So yeah. So, so maybe half an hour to an hour you, you, is the limit kind of. Yeah. Thing. And usually yeah. the, 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 pro, the spoon bending party itself lasts, other than the pendulum part, once we get started, it's never more than an hour right okay um although you know now what i may do you know usually it kind of winds down after about 45 minutes or so people if there's less bending going on or you're running out of utensils yeah running out of utensils maybe that might be a time to try the unbend thing i haven't tried that yet like i said you know with the pandemic wasn't able to get groups of people together but now i'm, I'm looking for a venue to start doing them again so yeah yeah cool or just start going around uh wherever you are and trying to find stuff to bend uh, if it's going really well why not um but yeah wow um is there any other kind of little tidbits you want to add on to it or are you are you satisfied that that's a pretty all comprehensive uh intro to how to do one of these well i mean that's fairly comprehensive and, and you know i i have a uh a piece i've written up on how to do one of these pk parties uh, which just just my observations beyond what Jack Halk has on his website. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, you'll have my email address 
posted and people can email me if they'd like a copy of that. Okay, cool. Um, if you send me the address that you want me to include, I will, I will send uh, all that. Uh, yeah okay i'll I'll do that that's absolutely fine um and i guess just to just to check on this like how if somebody didn't have you know couldn't arrange a party or whatever didn't have enough people around them and and you know they really wanted to either do it somebody by themselves or two people obviously we're not going to talk about whether it's possible or not but like is it would you kind of try to follow a roughly similar idea would you try to still you know make yourself silly and and get get the some kind of atmosphere even if you know there's just two of you or what would you say about i mean that? you could try that um i've certainly done that with certainly with the the side wheels i've done those on my own uh it it does i, I think it depends on your personality mm -hmm. it's going to really depend on what you know and how much you can get past that ownership resistance and witness inhibition it's it's like i said it's much easier if you see someone else do it yeah. Um, and you're not going to second guess yourself as much, but, uh, you, it's certainly worth a try. I mean, there's no reason to not try. Yeah. 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 It really isn't any reason to not try. It's just that it does help to have that energy. So to speak, the group energy, um, um like yeah, I said, yeah. I, I, I was in some respects, I was surprised. I was in Hawaii in 2019 for a conference and they had set me up with a, a, a spoon bending party and we had. I think 20 registrants or something like that. But um, it turned out that a number of registrants for the entire conference were native Hawaiian and they were doing a protest during the, the time of the conference um, against the University of Hawaii building a new telescope on kind of sacred ground more or less. And right. so I ended up with only five people. <laughs> and when I heard there were only gonna be five people, I talked to the person running the uh, conference and said, well, we'll try it. I've never tried with that few people. and we were able to get silly and uh you know and do that and it really it did still work with five people so cool yeah okay nice and would you say it'd be a roughly you'd follow a roughly similar pattern like a for trying to move something like if people want to try and move you know whatever it might be yeah absolutely. roughly similar yeah protocol okay cool um and i i guess i was wondering this as well is in terms of filming this phenomena or this phenomenon yeah um have you thought about you know in your in your parties or in in when you do bigger spoon bending parties like having a few various cameras around the room sure. or on people and and are you aware of any like video footage out there now that is compelling that as far as you're concerned is legitimate and everything like that because it feels sometimes like one of those things that you know like uh, evasive like we said earlier the trickster element and it's like could there be something like it doesn't want to be observed like the old observer effect thing um but yeah, have, have you you definitely, I mean, definitely they haven't filled. I, I, I know that Jack has, uh, Jack Houck has filmed some of his PK parties. I filmed a couple of things that I've done. Um, part of the problem is he certainly have not had full coverage of cameras. Uh, yeah. And, and part of the issue, I mean, you'd almost need a camera above looking down. So maybe a drone <laughs> that's stationary yeah. uh, <laughs> because the camera angles, you, you can't always tell what's going on with people's hands. Mm -hmm. So um and of course, there's not any close-ups of something, you know, bent, flopping over, or anything like that. You may not even catch that on camera. So, it doesn't seem to be uh, a problem to have cameras there. That has not seemed to deter, deter anybody uh, mm -hmm. or deter the PK, which can happen in other circumstances. I know, um, but you know, is that going to get in the way? That that's the question. Is you don't yeah. want someone uh moving about the room who's getting in the way of everybody uh making yeah. themselves you know the omnipresent presence and um but having cameras you know it's absolutely not a problem yeah cool because that would obviously be be incredible to have to get lucky and get that shot that clear shot of you know a spoon just whoops yeah just yeah that would that would really <laughs> be kind of cool yeah 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 do you and do you know of any videos on youtube that are like available publicly available that you think are legitimate um i don't know of any you know i really haven't mined youtube for these kinds of things yeah um but i've seen certainly plenty of video where it's pretty especially people i know <laughs> who are bending yeah. things um that they're not using pk at all uh it, you really can't, you know, honestly with YouTube, you can't tell if anything's legit or not, unless you have to consider the source. 
where did it yeah. come from? And did that person shoot it? Um, who's credible? Or did they were, were they given that footage by somebody else to pass along? I mean, yeah, it's the same thing yeah. with the the um, ghost photos. So many I've gotten over the years. So many people sending me pictures that a friend of them took of them, and in the picture is a ghost or some figure in the transparent figure in the background. And most of the time, and I know my colleague uh, Steve Parsons had this experience also in the UK. Most of the time, we can identify what ghost app that friend of theirs used to take that picture because we can send back a picture with the same ghost in our picture because mm. they have a gallery of um, suggested ghosts more or less. Um, yeah. So if somebody provided the footage, provided a photo to someone else who credible or not, the someone else being credible or not, who puts it up on YouTube or online, it's where did it come from? You know, what mm. is the actual source of that and what's it really showing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get. Well, I agree. Um, but yeah, how great that would be if you ever managed to get something on video, that would be great. And I'll and have to stick review, it up on YouTube. I can review the footage of the of the ones that have been shot. Um, that I've got a couple that yeah. got. And um, a colleague of mine from Germany was actually involved in, in the PK party where the the plastic spoon bent. I don't recall. Yeah. I don't think he actually got the plastic spoon on camera though, because he was he had yeah. a handheld video cam. Yeah, that's wild. The plastic one. Um, let me ask you um, any, again, this can be just a very, very brief answer if you want, but because we kind of just did a massive section with advice, but just any more general advice for people that don't tend to have any kind of experiences, but want to start having some, some kind of general psi experiences, whatever it might be, nothing specific. Well, well I mean, first of all, we all have spontaneous psychic experiences, not just, you know, not PK as much as ESP experiences, but we have a tendency, most people have a tendency to write them off. Mm -hmm. It's also important to know that unlike what we get from the media, ESP and even PK experiences are often very mundane and subtle. Uh, yeah. We, you know, it's not always about the future. If it's an ESP experience, sometimes it's something else. Uh, so just acknowledge that you're getting information that's your normal senses aren't picking up. <clears throat> and that simple acknowledgement will, you know, kind of focusing what's my normal senses and what's not. How did I know that? You know, sometimes we know things simply because we were exposed to it decades ago as we grew up. But a lot of times current information does not come through from our memory or from our senses. So you should just simply know that and accept that some of that is that channel of communication we call extrasensory or non-sensory perception as well. Mm -hmm. And just acknowledging that. Um, when you, you see things moving, if you see something fall, I mean, you can pretend like you did it or pretend like it was PK. You know, fact is pictures do fall off the wall because the nail works its way, way out. But I will tell you that, uh, and, and feel free. I learned this actually, I think it was Uri Geller who was doing this. Um, but early on in my, in my life in parapsychology and in magic, um, I learned that if you're at a party or at, at somebody's house and something falls down, um, you can always say, I did that. Just, just get in the habit of saying, I did that. And sometimes you have to say, I did that. I'm sorry. Uh, and it, it get it gets to the point where, um, you stop saying it. And then people look at you when something happens, you know, so you hear a noise in the back. It could have been the cat. You didn't see the cat. Right. You say, and they, they look at you like, did you do that Lloyd? So <laughs> that happens to me quite a bit. I was at a party years ago. Um, actually a friend of ours, friend of mine who was a magician was having a party, a lot of magicians there and a buddy of mine who was a skeptic and a magician. Um, we were sitting together talking and something fell behind, like literally something fell off a shelf. Could have been somebody bumped the wall from the other side of uh, the other room. And Bob and I together both said, I did that. And we looked at each other and we started laughing because he was doing it also. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> and what that does is it puts you in this mindset that even if you know you did not do that, when things do happen, you can accept that you did that. Yeah, it's kind of cr trying to create that habit, I guess. Yeah, of like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and freak your uh, friends out too. It's just kind of fun to. Yeah. There's an element. Yeah, the, the bonus. Okay, so Lloyd, now I've got a question from one of my patrons. He's called Jimmy the Earthling. Um, I'm going to look over here and read it word for word. Okay, so uh, Mr. Auerbach, could you comment on larger scale psychic influences? For example, could a talented spoon bender graduate to larger or denser objects like a horseshoe or car fender? 
Also, what do you think of really large scale, such as the claims of Ingo Swan ending a drought back in the 1970s? Thanks for your time. Okay. So psychokinesis is probably more bound by personal psychology and human rights psychology, performance psychology than, than ESP is. In fact, it's, you know, because the idea of ESP information is much more acceptable um, from a societal perspective, uh, mm -hmm. from a personal perspective, whereas the idea that our minds could cause action directly is a scary thing for most people. Um, so large scale things tend to happen. If they happen, they happen because of unconscious activity. So spontaneous activity that happens in poltergeist cases, for example, which come from living people, not from, from spirits at, at all, the way we look at them. But yeah, it would be possible certainly for someone to graduate to something like a horseshoe. I, I mentioned earlier about that one guy who bent that one inch thick aluminum rod. And I've seen other people, in one case we had, uh, one of the parties we had people bending steel rebar, mm. which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, it takes a lot of pressure or you have to use a lot of leverage or something like that. You're not Superman after all. Yeah. So you could definitely do that. But again, the mindset is um, getting us out of your own way and not thinking about what's going on or even considering that this is impossible, which is the biggest problem right off the bat. Bigger things really depends on you. Uh, we haven't seen people who have been able to control or regularly do bigger things, especially even in the spoon bending parties, much bigger than let's say those rods or a horseshoe, I think would fall into that, certainly. Uh, but it, conceivably, based on what we know from poltergeist activity, it would be possible, depending on, and this is something that comes up for us quite often, what your upper limit is, what your ceiling mm -hmm. is for what you can do. Um, for example, one of the remote viewers who I know best from the Stargate program, Joe McMonigal, has talked about, you know, he's incredibly good at remote viewing, but he, he feels he hit his ceiling, his aptitude. He hit the, hit the top. Right. And he can't get any better than that. That's his. Now, it may be that he believes he can't get any better, but he actually could if he could get past that belief. You know, this is the whole issue about humans in general. Uh, yeah. The Ingo Swan thing with the drought, you know, there was, there's a great book called The PK Man by Jeffrey Mishlove. Yes, Jeffrey Mishlove. Yeah. yeah, about Ted Owens, who could apparently play with weather. And there are stories from all over the world about individual, you know, of course, usually magic workers. Uh, shamans and other people who could affect the weather. And mm. we, there really hasn't been a concerted study of this. Whether Ingo Swan, did he end a drought or did he predict, because we knew he had ESP, did he know when the drought was going to stop? Mm, did he know when the rain was going to come? Uh, this yeah. is a big question in psychokinesis when you're not talking about <clears throat> things like uh, things that are static, like a spoon or a horseshoe, right? If you waited your entire life, that spoon is not going to bend on its own. You could observe that spoon forever and it's not going to bend on its own, right? Yeah. Um, a drought can end. And so predicting when a spoon is going to bend versus making the spoon bend, yeah, that's not, that's not an acceptable alternative. Predicting when a drought will end versus making a drought end is something that we have to consider. Mm, yeah and unfortunately i guess we would never be able to say with any certainty unless it was yeah well i don't even know yeah, yeah i mean if, if it's if if somehow it's a totally clear you know we have a drought it's totally clear there are no clouds no the weather maps show nothing happening and a person focuses and all of a sudden there's a storm that comes up yeah. i tend not to think that that's peak, that that's prediction <laughs> yeah that would be yeah. um an anomaly in meteorology that had never been seen before so but yeah, the Ingo Swan reference made me think of uh, the PK man, Ted Owens, as well, because I spoke to, in detail about him with Jeffrey fairly recently, and it was really, really interesting. Um, it's like wild stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but again, like, it, like, oh, do you want me? Do you want to see me make a, a lightning bolt appear just over there? You know, and then like, okay, watch this. But again, it's it, it could be predictive it could be precognitive it's hard to you right, know, divide right. the lines yeah before but either you, way obviously it's extraordinary before you even said let me make the lightning bolt appear over there your mind is telling you it's going to be there in a moment so get ready to say it's coming yeah and now <laughs> and yeah that, that's 
you know, precognition versus psychokinesis. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So would you, you don't think, you wouldn't be prepared to say there's a limit to it, but it's hard to, to say. Is that fair? I think that's fair to say, yeah. Um, you know, Ingo, although the book was ghostwritten, uh, wrote a great book. One of my favorite science fiction novels about psychic stuff is is technically, it's nominally by Ingo Swan, um, called Starfire. And it's about a rock star who gets not just super psychic power, but he opens up so much he has mega psychic ability and decides to actually stop nuclear warfare and the whole bit. So, you know, this is, it, it's almost like an origin story for a superhero in some respects. And we yeah. see the, you know, in science fiction and certainly in comic books, we see those kinds of psychokinetic and other powers showing up. Yeah, awesome. Um, have you got any last brief words you want to say about uh, about mind matter, spoon bending, PK, before we move on and, and talk about apparitions from here on out? Yeah, you know, when people tell you that it doesn't happen, uh, that mind cannot affect matter directly because typically people are thinking outside. Let's think about something that science has still not fully explained, and that's the placebo effect, mm. which is a benchmark for pharmaceutical and medical research. Yeah, That is the mind affecting the body, and yeah. that is psychokinesis. So even my act of talking technically, by definition, is a form of mind over matter. So we have the capacity, our consciousness, the more we learn about consciousness, the more we'll learn about what we can possibly do. But we set mm -hmm. limits on ourselves physically. This is clear in the in sports and other endeavors. We set our limits on ourselves intellectually. You know, you tell a kid that they're stupid and they grow up thinking they're stupid and they may not actually rise to their full potential for that. So PK, the idea of PK is we've got to get out of our own way. We've got to accept that we have more potential than what we're told that we have, whether it's by our parents or society or religion or science, mainstream science for that. Yeah, brilliant. There's so many little parallels of, of what you've been saying uh, to my conversation with Helane recently, um, where like she talked, she bent a rebar. Uh, she tells the story in my conversation. We talked in in at some in some detail about the placebo effect and like how this that relates to all of right. this kind of phenomena. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting because when you were mentioning the rebar a minute ago, I thought I was like my conversation with Helene, and then you just talked about the placebo, and I was like, oh wow. Uh, you know, I'm uh, psychic. I know about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so apparitions. So maybe to start, you could just give like a 20 second definition again i won't ask you to do much longer just because if people want to have more of an intro they can check out my first conversation with you where you kind of define apparitions hauntings poltergeist and we talk right. about it all in in a bit broader um so yeah if you could just give a really quick definition and then i'll kind of give you the floor to to share a few of uh, your experiences anecdotes stories um however we want to phrase it things that you've uh, yeah, sure. experienced so for us, an apparition, it's a term that we've used for a long time. People will call them ghosts, of course. Um, most apparitions we're, we're talking about are apparitions of the, of the dead. And an apparition mm -hmm. is something that you, as a witness, see, hear, feel, smell, and so on. You perceive, because it's not coming through your senses at all. Yeah. It's perception. It represents someone who has passed away or perhaps may even be out of their body. And you're capable and they are capable of interaction with you. So there is a clear recognition that consciousness is present as opposed to just some sort of image that you might be seeing from the past. It is our consciousness after death, essentially. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, take it away with okay. whichever experience that you you want to kind of go, go into first. Um, you said you've maybe got a couple of fairly quick ones and then a slightly longer one, which, right, would, be, which right. would be awesome. So um, let, first I want to tell you a, a personal story. Um, I mentioned Martin Caden in the section about mind over matter. Uh, yeah. Marty, I got to know in 1992. He was, uh, although my dad had known him years before um, when my father was doing some news, working with NBC on news coverage of the Mercury and Gemini space shots. Martin Caden was a science fiction writer. His book Cyborg became the $6 million man TV show. And he was involved in that show and the Bionic Woman show for a while. Um, his book Marooned, uh, which predicted the Apollo 13 disaster was made into a movie oh, wow. in the sixties with Gregory Peck, won an Academy Award. He was a science writer as well, especially on aviation and aeronautics and space science. He was a consultant to NASA. When I got to know him, he was the guy NASA would call when they couldn't remember things or find the records of things in their history. And I was at wow. his home in Cocoa Beach a number of times when that happened. 
Uh, yeah. When I met him, he claimed he could do mind over matter. And I had no clue. This was even that, that this was a guy who seemed like he was, was mainstream was able to do that. And he showed that. And I worked with him for many years. He was kind of a mentor to me and spurred on my real interest in PK. He was misdiagnosed, um, I think in 1995, uh, may have been a little bit earlier than that, um, with something going on with his vocal cords. It was actually thyroid cancer it was starting out. And unfortunately, it was misdiagnosed and caught, not caught until much later when it had already spread throughout his body. Um, here's a point of mind over matter. He was, he was finally diagnosed and given uh, the diagnosis by the Mayo Clinic. And he called me from there with his wife and told me what was going on and that they had given him eight weeks to live. And yeah. I asked him what his response was. And he told me how he cursed them out. And for, for every week after his eight weeks, he yelled at them on the phone. He called them and yelled mm -hmm. at them on the phone. Uh, because by telling someone, Marty's point was by telling someone you have eight weeks, you're giving them an expiration date when that may not be the case. So uh, yeah. we kidded about the fact that after he died, since he knew he was going, he was going to haunt me. That's what he said. <laughs> so when, he, when I got the call from his wife that he passed away uh, in March 1997, um, I toasted him like I was supposed to, like we had agreed. And then I waited. Um, you know, most ex experiences of apparitions tend to happen within 24 to 72 hours of the person's death that you knew. Sometimes when, you know, the amazing ones happen when you did not know they died and you still see them yeah. at the moment of death or shortly thereafter. So uh, this is not suggestion. So a week goes by and nothing happens. I figured, okay, he is not capable of showing up in any way, shape or form, or he's busy doing something else. <laughs> um, week and a half goes by and I'm driving early morning um, to the Oakland airport. I'm on a highway going through Oakland and my car, which was less than three months old, still sort of smelled like a new car. No one had ever smoked in my car. We didn't have any heavy perfumes or anything like that. I suddenly started sm smelling a very, very stinky cigar. And the smell was coming from the passenger seat. And I, I, it felt like somebody was sitting there, even though I looked over and there's nobody there. And so the smell, I absolutely identified with the cigars that Martin Caden smoked. And I, so this is at seven o'clock in the morning, Pacific time. Um, I start talking to kind of saying my goodbyes to what I thought was Martin Caden. And then it went away. It lasted maybe five minutes. Um, I flew up to Portland, Oregon from Oakland. Before I left the airport, I got on a payphone, if you all remember those, and I didn't have a cell phone at the time. Uh, and I called a friend of Marty's who I'd met a number of times um, at Martin's place down in Florida when I visited, uh, Bob Button. And Bob uh, was a pilot, friend of Marty's, and had known about his, his PK stuff as well. So Bob picks up the phone. I say, hey, Bob, it's Lloyd Auerbach. And then he says, Lloyd, I can't believe you're calling. You must be psychic. And I said, oh, of course I am, because I always say that. Right? <laughs> and I said, why do you think that, Bob? And he said, you're not going to believe what happened, or maybe you will. He was flying his Cessna alone, his plane, in New Jersey, where he was from. And at 10, 10 the in the morning, his cockpit filled up with stinky cigar smoke, as he put it, and he felt like Caden was with him. And he had his goodbyes, and then the it was gone. Then he said, that's not the best part. I just got off the phone with um, John. He mentioned a test pilot friend of Marty's and his who I had not met, but whose name I had heard down in um, also down in Florida. And he said at 1020, John was flying his plane and the same thing happened. So I then tell Bob my experience. So my experience happens at 7 a.m. Pacific time. That's 10 a.m. Eastern time. 1010, Bob Buttons. 1020, John Tracy's experience. And this was us talking about the idea that Martin was giving us the same exact experience across the board when we were alone to say goodbye. Wow. Um, finally, within a couple of weeks, Bob called me back and said he had talked to, it turned out to be 25 of us on either side of our experiences in a car alone or in a plane alone had had the same experience. Wow. So yeah. that, that was a really cool apparitional experience. So it's important to know incredible. that apparitions are not just seen. They are felt, smelled, you know, all of that as well. Yeah. yeah. By different people, depending on what your process is. 
Um, another experience that I can talk about very briefly is um, someone I knew, uh, and I knew because I, I was very good friends with her brother-in-law. Uh, I had been at Thanksgiving dinners at her brother-in-law's house where I'd met this couple many times. And they called me up and said they had just bought a, a house in Hayward, California. That's not too far from me. And they think the house is haunted. So of course they're going to call their friend Lloyd. And yeah. uh, it turned out that um, they bought this house from a woman who moved maybe about 30 miles away into another town to Vallejo. And uh, her husband had been in home hospice care, had died of cancer about a year before. Uh, and they move into this house and every once in a while, this male figures, this older male figure pops up and is staring at them, like scowling at them. And occasionally the, the woman and her husband and the kids are even picking up that he's saying, get out of my house. I, I, this is my house, not consistent. So, First thing I did was I, they had the number of the widow and I called her and I wanted to talk to her about her husband. And she said, and I said, well, here's what's going on. I, I told her and she said, well, that doesn't make any sense. He's followed me here to Vallejo. She was seeing him in Vallejo. So I did a comparison of timing. And if she was seeing him in Vallejo, they were not having any experiences in Hayward in the old house and vice versa. He had pretty much rebuilt that house. He had redesigned the house. They bought the house year, decades before he had built it up, added additions and all that. So it was, it was, he was embedded in that house. Uh, so this was a kind of a really interesting experience where the timing worked. The experiences were the same, although, of course, the widow was not being told to, to leave the house. Um, and yeah. when I was there, I, I brought a medium with me. It was somebody I had just started working with. And she was able to connect with this guy. And we got a little bit more information, which did check out with the widow later on. Uh, and, you know, there was an issue here because the family did not want peace. They didn't want to have this guy bugging them to get out of his house. It's now their house. So we, yeah. we went through the explanation for that. But then uh, something that had happened in an earlier situation with another medium I worked with um, came to mind because, you know, we're asked to get rid of the ghost. And the best you can do is like ask them or somehow get them moving in another way, forcing them out of the house, which that's that's a whole different thing. So I actually had Maria, the medium, say, ask the question, um, hey, look, when you were alive, did you have any place you ever wanted to go or anything you wanted to do you could not do for whatever reason? And Maria is looking at me like I'm nuts because I didn't pr prepare her for this. So she's listening and she said, she's, she gets very puzzled. She, she's laughing a little bit. She says, well, he said he always wanted to go on safari in Africa. And so I said, well, you know, he's dead. Uh, he can get in the face of that lion or any other animal and they can't do anything to him. He just needs to hop a plane or just think himself to Africa and he can go. And Maria is looking at me like I'm crazy and turns back to where she thinks the ghost is, the guy is standing. And she tells him that, and she said, he's nodding okay Oh, he's gone. And that was the last time anybody saw him in the Hayward house. Now, really? I checked with the widow months later. She hadn't seen him for quite some time, but now he was back visiting her, but he never appeared back in the Hayward house at all. So those kinds wow. of stories, I mean, you know, think about it. It's very, very goofy to even do that, but it seemed to have worked for the family and it seemed to have had an impact in the occurrence of experiences as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's incredible. I wonder if he had a nice safari. You know, that would be. I wonder if the animals would sense him as well. Well, that you know, that's always possible. Uh, you know, yeah, that that is possible. Not all animals are psychic the same way, but um, you know, again, he 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 doesn't have a physical presence, so it wouldn't really make a difference. Yeah, at all. Um, yeah, and we've done that with other situations where people have had like either problem or annoying apparitions, and you know, kind of playing travel agent just think about it. And honestly, the idea in some respects goes back a little bit to Ingo Swan, who we mentioned earlier in his book, um, To Kiss Earth Goodbye, which came out in the 70s. He was able to capable of doing out of body work. He could go out of his body and travel around the world. He also, mm -hmm. uh, in To Kiss Earth Goodbye, he decided to try to go further than that. So he describes going to Jupiter and Saturn, and he described physical characteristics of the rings of Saturn, as well as a ring around Jupiter, that was not visible normally and other characteristics that are in the book that Voyager confirmed when Voyager got there, things that, you know, astronomers and, and NASA folks said, well, that's not possible. And they actually yeah. were true. So if you can leave your body and do that, why not 
travel if you're an apparition yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and it's maybe just understanding that you can i don't know that's you know kind of people talk about ghosts that, being but... stuck in a ha in a location and it's really they're sticking themselves they don't know that they can mm. do that because typically we don't find that movies that our imagery that we get the ghost stories the movies the tv shows the things that are programmed us all our lives mostly don't show that yeah Look, I'm leaving lots of questions on the table with, with your experiences there because we haven't got, really got time for me to go into them. Um, is there one last kind of experience or anecdote you wanted to briefly yeah, talk through? Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me, um, cool. there's a case that I did back in the, from the late 80s into the 90s and occasionally a little bit after that. There was a restaurant which still exists out in Tracy, California. It's about an hour and a half east of San Francisco called the Banta Inn. A little, sort of in a little tiny town of its own. Uh, called Banta. It's a one street town, more or less. Um, right. The restaurant was, the place was built um, as an inn and saloon back in the 1890s. Uh, it was for a while, the second floor was a bordello. Uh, the second floor did burn down, burn off in 1910. The owners, um, certain family were involved in the ownership for quite some time. And eventually it was purchased by, it was owned by a man named Tony Gukin and his wife. His wife had been connected to the previous owner, the previous managers and owners before, historically and otherwise. <clears throat> and um, Tony um, was a, an ever-present owner. He was the manager. He often bartended himself. A lot of regulars knew him. Uh, he died very suddenly in 1968. And shortly after his death, uh, the regulars talked about seeing him. Uh, there were some regulars who didn't even know he had died, but they, they talked about seeing him in the restaurant. Now, initially, from what I was told, nobody paid any attention to those regulars because regulars meaning they sit at the bar all day and drink, right? Yeah. yeah. But then uh, there's a bar area, you go in through the bar <clears throat> and you go to the back, which is the restaurant. And people, when Tony was alive and he was on break, he would occasionally sit in this one corner table in the bar area uh, and he'd have two hands of poker. He'd play, play poker against himself to practice playing poker against his friends, typically with a big bottle of beer in between the, the two hands. And people would remark about Tony doing that, right? So now after he's dead, new people coming in, people would remark about seeing the guy in the corner and asking about the guy, who's the guy playing poker, playing cards with himself, even though he's not there at any, at any yeah. point. So this went on for a while. Um, new owners took over. Um, Joan Borland and her husband at the time, uh, Dave, uh, purchased. Uh, and Joan had grown up in the area and had known Tony growing up. She considered him kind of an uncle, you know, a de facto uncle. So mm -hmm. she bought the place because she knew Tony's ghost was there and because she loved the place. And over time, physical things started actually happening. Um, we had more and more witnesses, not just seeing him sitting in the corner, but people, first of all, were seeing him behind the bar or in other parts. And then physical things started happening, glasses moving across the bar. Um, something that continued quite often was, even to the time that I was there, was that Tony, when he was alive, would actually stack coins in the open register drawer, nice and neatly in between making drinks. And the bartenders would report, and I actually saw this, we messed up the coins closed the register drawer, waited a couple of minutes, opened it up, and there were nice stacks, nice neat stacks, things like that. Um, so um, the key element for Dave Borland, who was an Alameda Car Ca County Sheriff's deputy at the time, was he didn't believe in ghosts, even though Joan did. And uh, he took all the descriptions from people who claimed to have seen this ghost and found that they were very similar. So he gathered photographs of, uh, first, of Tony and of many of uh, Tony's friends, regulars, they were of Tony's age, approximate age and description. And every single time he showed them to these witnesses, it was like picking them out of a mug book. They all picked Tony Guggen every single time. Wow. Yeah. My visits included interviews with dozens of people. Um, the first time I was there with a TV show called Hard Copy, uh, an ashtray popped off, literally lifted up off the bar, slammed down on the bar right behind the director. There was no one behind the bar at that end of the bar. There's somebody that the bartender and the owner at the other end. Um, the camera was pointed at me. So I saw it. They heard it. The camera heard the sound. If I smacked down the bar, they didn't see anything, of course, at that point. Uh, I saw a glass then slide across the bar. Again, not on camera. Ca 
Tony is very camera shy for that. We have caught a couple things over the years. And time and time again, when I went back, um, we would have physical things actually being seen um, by multiple witnesses at the time. I talked to physicists from Lawrence Berkeley National, Lawrence, excuse me, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. One physicist in particular, we got on camera a little bit for sightings. Uh, he would bring his kid there for lunch and they would also, many of the researchers would go there, as, as this guy said, to see the show because things would move. And uh, the CD jukebox, the CDs would start flipping on their own, sometimes switch over to a Patsy Cline song because that was Tony's favorite. Uh, and we actually had a circumstance late at night after closing where the jukebox started playing on its own um, and played very silly it was uh, spirits in the material world by the police and the jukebox wasn't plugged in yeah played the song of course shut down done really? so tony yeah. had a good sense of humor and we had a lot of heard, had heard a lot of humorous stories but this is one of the few places i can say that i've seen multiple physical things from an apparition case uh normally yeah. that's related to living people but this was definitely not that we also had a number of things that happened that, you know, we found explanations for as well that were. Yeah. But you had a number of physical things. You had a number of people pick him out of, of various photos and things like that. So that that's pretty compelling. And uh, I brought um, a number of psychics with me. We, um, we did uh, a Japanese, one of the Japanese TV shows I did with a medium named Mrs. Gibo. I brought her there. Mm. Uh, she didn't know where she was going. And she started talking to Tony, um, actually identified him from the, from a photo as well like in multiple yeah. photos she was able to pick them out and as she's talking to him all of a sudden one of the an old actual wagon wheel from stagecoach was turned into a chandelier above uh, kind of above the the walkway where you walk back to the restaurant and it started swinging on its own we all saw it start swinging and mrs gibo then gave uh, she was shinto in her belief and you give food or or drink as an offering to spirits so she gave brought out a, a, a drink for tony and as soon as she came under the chandelier, it stopped. No momentum, no inertia. It just stopped as if somebody put their hand up. They caught that on camera for the Japanese uh, for Japanese TV. That part of it. That's cool. So yeah, yeah a lot went on at the Banda Inn over the years. Yeah, that's that's wild. And were you able to communicate with him directly, or just through the, always through the mediums? Medium. I mean, I didn't have. I've had very few apparitional experiences myself. The one with uh, Martin Caden that I mentioned. I've had a couple of others, but they were either typically either feeling like I was patted on the back or a smell or uh, on a couple mm -hmm. of occasions, uh, a voice. Basically yeah. Saying hello. yeah. Wow. Amazing though. If we had more time, I'd love to start like delving into, you know, why we would smell that specific smell and things like that. Like, I wonder whether, you know, in this example, I wonder whether he had a choice of, you know, which smell well, to leave behind I mean, or can, is it just the one that's that, most. Answer that very simply. I mean, there's a reason why ghosts have clothing on. It's because they're, self-image of that consciousness has closest their self-image and yeah. so when we think of ourselves we have a a fully developed think of it as a mental hologram of ourselves which would probably have information about our smell um how we sound how we look all of that and on top yeah. of everything else when apparitions are seen after their death you know unlike the movies you're not seen if you die in a tragic car accident you're not seen like the, <sighs> Your, your arm broken and your and blood all over your body, you're seen looking better. And in fact, somebody dies in their 90s, they're seen looking sometimes as early as their 30s. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a, self -image. That's a very good point. Good explanation. Um, let me just ask you one or two last questions before we wrap this up. Just, just real quick ones. You can kind of give me quick answers. Um, this one is from my editor and co-producer, Harmony. Um, and you kind of alluded to half answering it like a, a, not long ago. So I'm going to kind of tweak it. Um, she was basically wondering... Um, how commonly apparitions apparition phenomena are normally associated with a recent death um and so to kind of tweak it because you did say it's often people that have died within kind of 48 72 yeah. hours so i'd say kind of to, to go the other way around is it how how rare is it or how common would it be for it to be a much a much longer delay so say like 10 20 20 years plus very very um, rare it would be very very rare it is very rare 
I, you know, mm. I, I can't give you a specific st st uh, stat because we haven't really figured it out. No, of course not. But yeah. it seems yeah. like something like 95% of all the apparition experiences are people who have just recently, who have just died. And it's mm. like one time, that's it. They, they come to say goodbye yeah. or they just show up to you, that's it, done. Like with Martin Caden, right? Um, there's a smaller percentage that stick around for a while, not necessarily years, uh, but some do stick around for, for years or decades, depending, but it's all about them. It's not about what keeps them there. They keep themselves there sometimes yeah. for various reasons. And then there are very, very few where physical activity accompanies the apparitional sighting, like with the Banta Inn. That's rare, very rare. <laughs> but would, would you say it's it's possible that like there could be a 20 year gap sometimes between the death and an apparition? Have you ever come across a case where that was... There, there are cases. The situation. There are cases on record where sometimes the individual shows up to a, uh, a living spouse on the anniversary of their death, or on the on their actual mm -hmm. anniversary, their wedding anniversary. Um, we mm -hmm. see that in the literature. I haven't had a case where there's suddenly been an apparition that had, that had been like somebody who died and then showed up at their old house decades later. Um, yeah. But you know, the the question then I would want a medium to ask that apparition is, where you been all this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because maybe exactly. they were traveling the world or went, you know, went to Saturn and Jupiter like Ingo Swan. The billion dollar question. Right. What we all want to know. Um, I might have asked you this last time. We definitely didn't go into any detail on it. And again, it could be something that we could talk about for quite a while, but just in a in a real quick answer, do you think there's a dark side to this phenomena as well as the the nicer, friendlier stuff? And um yeah, if we had more time, I was going to ask you what was the most unnerving experience you've uh, had with it. Well, but maybe we'll save quick, that for next time. My most unnerving experiences have only been with living people, so we can put that for a minute. <laughs> um, in cases, by the way. So, uh, yeah. all right. So the dark side. I mean, there's. There, I mean, there are people in my field who do believe that there are, you know, evil, bad spirits, or even other types of entities out there. I don't technically ascribe to that. Um, mm -hmm. the way that they might, I don't like to use the word evil, um, you know, and I, on ghost hunting shows, they talk about malevolent spirits and I've yet to meet a malevolent person. I mean, some politicians I'd kind of are on the border for that, but bullies and a-holes, so to speak, people who are mm -hmm. really not good people, not necessarily evil, but not people you wanted to be around. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. We do see that yeah. and people do yeah. get bullied sometimes or attempted, you know, there are attempted bullying uh, by, by apparitions afterwards, but just know that as a living person, you got a lot more power than they do. They really can't hurt you. They can't do anything other than to scare yeah. you or to mentally, you know, to very verbally abuse you and do that kind of thing, which you can get yeah. past. It's, it's not hard. Um, okay. So the other side of the dark side is fear of yeah. what we believe ghosts are like. And that mm -hmm. fear is being hit, you know, drummed into us by pop culture constantly, and especially yeah. by the ghost hunting shows. I mean, I, I know of ghosts of people who call me after having had a ghost hunting group, local ghost hunting group, kick them out of the house so they could do their EVP overnight. Uh, and in the middle of the night, they get a call at the hotel that they got that they got some sort of a growl on their supposed electronic voice phenomena, which could have been anything like a stomach growl. And so they left because clearly that growl represented a demon. Now this couple, this family is freaked out, traumatized, yeah. and they want some help. And we have to first bring them down from that. So that's a real dark side also. Yeah, 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 I get you. So I suppose, yeah, in terms of the dark side, like evil, you don't think it's there's anything that's more evil than we see on on in our living reality? Oh, absolutely not. It's, and we don't see typically just, like the ghosts of serial killers. Range yeah. kill, that just doesn't, that, those are not reported so mm. uh I mean, it's interesting there are there's for apparitions you know there's place memory the, the haunting the re residual stuff where there's bad stuff that had happened people pick that up mm -hmm. that's a different story altogether that's yeah information not activity and uh but i i i you know there might be some things out there that are harmful or dangerous i don't like to put the word evil or demonic or malevolent on them because a great white shark is not an evil malevolent thing it is a predator that is its nature it is harmful and dangerous but not evil yeah so we have to look at it yes. that way too yeah that's a good point that's a good point well made um 
Uh, what do you think, or what common misconceptions, again, in a real quick nutshell, what common misconceptions, other than the ones we've already spoken about, do you think people have about apparitions or ghosts um, that you can kind of set straight yeah. now in a, yeah, in, a, in a quick answer? First of all, if you don't see it, it can't be there. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. number one, yeah. uh, you know, um, if you, that because people perceive these things differently, we have experiences where people, the same person who sees an apparition, the person next to them only hears something or feels something. So it's not consistent. It's that's us. That's not them. Um, mm. That they change personality after they die, that they suddenly know everything. You know, as one of my colleagues put it, dying does not significantly improve your IQ. Uh, so that's always, you know, they can't predict the future. <laughs> All of those things are misconceptions. Or no more than we can. No, anyway. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly no better than the weather guy. Uh, yeah. Psychics can't, you know, I, that's a, that's a whole different question. <laughs> precognition yeah. is another thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and then you know the other misconceptions is that they have some sort of magic mystical powers they can physically harm you um where perhaps there's a mental idea that they want to hurt you but that's not a physical push so if somebody says they were pushed mm-hmm. down the stairs by an apparition generally i find that that's because of, they're assuming the apparition pushed them because they tripped because they got freaked out when they saw the apparition and we do see that in a lot of situations. So, uh, you know, yeah. people ask, and then there's a other thing, because this has even come up recently on um, with a group of uh, folks in my field online, uh, protecting you. How do you protect yourself from, you know, bad spirits? And my answer is, I don't believe that they can hurt me. That's my protection. And yeah. so far, I've not, even in those cases where people say that they're having negative stuff happen, I don't find that that is, is bothering me because as a living person, I have more power if you want to call that i call it that in my consciousness than a dead person does yeah cool good advice um so when i spoke to helen halane helane i keep mentioning her um i asked her right at the end where i was trying to squeeze in questions like i'm trying to do here and i said uh, can you answer what do you think happens after we die in like 60 seconds and it's obviously one of those questions that we could talk about for like 24 hours um but can you give me like a super nutshell version sure. of what you think <laughs> Um, and of course, the apparitions who are here are different than the most who, who the next stage of existence. So uh, I will say mm-hmm. that difference. They haven't gone there yet, where, wherever there is or right. whatever that is. So I, I personally believe that uh, it is more different than we can describe. Because mm-hmm. it's a completely different state of existence that can only be described through mediums to us in words we can uh, and concepts we can understand. But it's probably more different than we can even imagine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great answer. So I totally agree. Um, and I, the last question before I ask you just for a few last words, a brief message is, have you seen a UFO since we last spoke? No. <laughs> well, I no. mean, I've seen things in the sky. I wasn't sure what it was. So I technically it's an unidentified, unidentified flying object, but yeah, not a traditional what people call a UFO or a UA. Not an extraordinary, nothing, yeah, nothing, nothing, no, I have, I have, nothing super anomalous not. that, that had you running home. Yeah. No, oh well no. okay me, me neither oh well um so yeah that that brings me to the last thing and it's just yeah if is there anything you'd like to say to people that have watched and listened any any last words or message whatever you want to say yeah i mean it's just that there's a quite a bit of literature in 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 the field of parapsychology if you, if you really you know look at at who we are and the people writing this stuff um about psychokinesis about apparitions there's a long history of looking at both of these subjects especially apparitions back to the 1800s and i just encourage you to learn as much as you can learn different viewpoints that's perfectly okay as well but what are the patterns we have determined what what have we actually found that's all from our research looking at people's experiences outside the lab and the experiences especially research with pk and such inside the lab so learn more and that's and keep an open mind to all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for today, Lloyd. Really appreciate it. Had a lot of fun again. Um, I, it, so, so fascinating. And I can't wait to try my first PK party whenever I get around so to let that. Me know how you do. I'll definitely let you know. Yeah, I will. I will. And if anybody that's listening or watching is going to try it and, and you or somebody you're with manages to bend a spoon or, or some other object, please let me know. Please comment or, or inform me somehow and I'll pass it on to Lloyd. And, and yeah, that would be brilliant. But yeah, thank you again. Um, this is a lot of fun and, and I really appreciate your time. You're welcome, Ben. Thank you to Lloyd Auerbach for talking with me and thank you for listening. I hope you feel inspired to try and bend a spoon. Please let us know in the comments if you make it. 
For relevant links, other interviews to check out, and more info, please see the description. If you want to continue unraveling the universe with us, please subscribe and encourage others to do the same. Thank you.